Acha on behalf of SP ITISM student chapter are honored to welcome Mr. Subodeep Das Gupta sir in the third webinar under the SPE Winter School series. Uh, Harshita, your uh, please unmute. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Okay. So Mr. Das Gupta is a renowned petrophysicist who has worked on both open hole and taste hole petrophysical evaluations with all, all kinds of measurements from triple combo to sigma to spectroscopy to dielectric to anamat to sonic. While some of these measurements definitely focus on the petrophysics part more, sonic measurements are a different beast and can connect domains from geophysics to geomechanics. After working as a petrophysicist in Abu Dhabi for 12 years, he is currently supporting LWD operational petrophysics in Doha, Qatar. Lastly, I welcome everyone who is participating in this program to the designated web platform. I firmly believe that we would be enlightened much over the subject after hearing uh, his thoughts on today's topic, petrophysics. I welcome you all again on behalf of SPE ITSM students chapter for attending this program and making it a grand success. So before starting with today's webinar, I would like to request all the attendees to keep, please keep their mics muted for a smooth conduction of this session. Attendees can write down their queries in the chat box. We'll have a separate question and answer session for that at the end. So, so finally, uh, we hand over this virtual platform to you now. You may start the lesson in winter school now. Okay, thank you very much Vaidehi and Harshita for the welcome. So, to be very honest, when I was asked initially to talk about petrophysics, my initial thought was that petrophysics is very, is a very big subject. Like it's a discipline on which I have worked for for the past 13 years. So, how can I present that uh, to all of you? So, I wanted to fo uh, focus it a little bit and what I'm going to talk about is basically operational petrophysics or what is known as operation petrophysics, why we do it, how we do it and what is it, okay. So I hope uh, you guys get to know something more than what you are already doing uh, in your classes and hope it helps you a little bit. So let's get started. Okay. So this is a brief agenda of what we are going to talk about. So whenever we talk about petrophysics, we are going to talk about petrophysical logs. So the first uh, thing I want to address is why do we log actually? What are, is, is the target of doing a logging? what are our log acquisition choices uh, if i want to make a decision on that i have a certain kind of a well i have certain kind of objectives how do i decide what kind of log i'm going to acquire what are the different types of logs i have two slides on what makes carbonates so special uh, so my experience has been entirely in the Middle East. So I have worked 90% of the reservoirs I look at is carbonates, okay? So I have two slides on what makes carbonates so special, okay? Why is it so different from plastics and sandstones and these kind of things? Now, I have two case studies. The first one is a very simple one and I'll try to show how we try to put things together, different measurements. And the second case study is a little bit more complex and it actually goes into a very heavy details of petrophysics as well as some other things, uh, which talks about unconventionals in the Middle East. Uh, I might speed up on this case study depending on how much time we have, okay? Uh, finally, I'll end up with uh, some discussion points or conclusion as a slide at the end, okay? So, 
this was the very very first log which was carried out in 1928 in Peshalbon, France, uh, and it was a log of SP and resistivity. And the main reason that we had logged at that point of time actually remains same today as well, even though they may have increased. So the basic target is to find hydrocarbons, okay? Now, nowadays when we talk about petrophysics, when we talk about logging, we do not focus only on the oil and gas industry. We are also focusing on other industries like uh, geothermal and these kind of reservoirs. As of now, this presentation is more geared towards oil and gas, okay? So our first target why we log is find hydrocarbons. We want to know how much hydrocarbon there is. Uh, what is the type? Is it oil? Is it gas? Is it condensate? What is the volume of that hydrocarbon? Now, an even bigger question is, and which is probably even more important, is that what is going to flow? And just because it is there does not mean it is going to flow. The, it's there means it's there. Yes, it is there in the reservoir, but will it produce? And that's uh, critical that how much of it will produce and at what rate does it make it economic? And based on all of this, uh, on a reservoir scale, mm, we want to optimize how many wells do we need, how are we going to produce from this reservoir, and these kind of things. Okay. So, to put it in a different context, why we log, we have all these kind of reservoirs, we rather formations. We have shale, which is commonly um, a cap rock. It may not be a cap rock everywhere because in the unconventionals uh, in the US, the source rock or the shales is where we produce from, okay? uh but conventionally in a conventional reservoir shale is more um, possibly a cap rock which is capping the reservoir uh, below it um, we have we might have a different kind of a lithology we might have sand we might have shale in between or we might have limestone and what is our target for logging we want to see the formation which i saw in a previous well do i see the same formation if I see the same formation, then I know that this formation is continuous. It's uh, going from one place to another. And then I want to know what kind of porosity, permeability we have in the reservoirs, which is the sandstone or the limestone typically. What is the type of the fluids and the amount of the fluids? Uh, that is basically what we are trying to get. The other part, what we try to get is if I have fractures or faults in my reservoir, because fractures or faults in my reservoir, they can help in production. In some cases, they may be detrimental as well because they might contribute to water production coming from below. If I have an oil water contact, and if I have a water below, then there is a possibility that the water can come up through the fractures as well. So whether it is mm, to our benefit or not to our benefit, we still want to know about faults and fractures, okay? It can lead to mud losses when we are drilling. It can lead to a lot of issues. So basically, the, it's very, very critical. So if I look at a proper field, and how data acquisition in that field changes over time. Um, this is a sort of graph that we would look at that we start off with the exploration phase and we go into a development phase and then we go into various recovery phases. Like uh, after the primary drive is finished, we go for a secondary, and the tertiary recovery mechanisms that might be water flood, gas flood, uh, low salinity fluid flood, that we are injecting different fluids in order to try to 
get whatever remaining hydrocarbon I have. Once we get to a stage where we feel that that's it, I cannot increase production any further, it goes through a decline and abandoning a field stage. Okay. So if I look at the number of wells that we drill, we drill more wells in the beginning of the field. Okay. We drill more wells at the exploration stage and for the development stage. After that, uh, it remains flat because basically what we are is in a maintenance phase where we are just producing. Okay, we are producing from these wells and at that point of time the logging which is basically carried out is mostly cased hole logging. Uh, cased hole logging might be for uh, production logs, might be for looking at reservoir monitoring Monitoring that where we are looking at measurements to see whether we are draining the reservoir as per our expectation or not. Uh, at some point of time, we might decide that we might want to drill. Uh, we might might want to add some more wells in order to, like infill wells in order to help in production or increase production. Okay. But basically, the, the main drilling is in the beginning of the field, OK? So mostly, we have open hole logs uh, at that point of time. Later, we will mostly have cased hole logs. Now, once we have drilled the wells and we have cased the wells, after that, we cannot really run most of our open hole logs. So we are limited in terms of the data that we can acquire once we have drilled and cased all the wells. So a lot of the information which is uh, acquired in the beginning is difficult or almost impossible to acquire later. So and this information can be very critical for field development. OK. And later when we are doing some EOR methods and these kind of things, uh, by the way, I'm it's definitely going to be using some terms and some uh, some short forms. So if you guys have any doubts or anything like that, please um, just speak up and ask. Uh, not an issue at all. OK. So anyway, so EOR stands for enhanced oil recovery. So whenever we go into secondary and tertiary recovery mechanisms, that's we would apply different techniques in order to enhance the production from the reservoir. OK. So um, what are our options when we want to do a logging in one well? OK, when we want to log in a well, our Conventional option is the second option which you see on the slide, which is I drill a well and then I run tools on wireline uh, in order to acquire the data. But this is what was common a long time before. Initially, when we started petrophysical logging, what we used to do was wireline logging. And when we when everybody talks about logging, that's what they refer to in general. Uh, nowadays, most of the wells are deviated wells. They are high angle wells, horizontal wells. So it's difficult to log wildline in these kind of wells. OK, there are some options and I had, do have a slide to uh, talk about that in some time. Uh, but basically, uh, our biggest option in high angle wells is to log while drilling. And we have uh, we have different kinds of tools for that. We have measurement while drilling and logging while drilling. They are commonly known in the industry as MWD logging and LWD logging. OK, uh, MWD is where we are basically trying to look at uh, the well in terms of the position of the well. Uh, we are trying to locate the well in a 3D space. So I want to know at what depth we are, what is the inclination or deviation and azimuth of that well. So that tells me where I am in a 3D space. Am I on 
my target am i going towards the reservoir or am i going not so and lwd tools generally are uh, taking the formation measurements which are like gamma ray resistivity density neutron and these kind of things okay uh I, to the host as well as others i am assuming you are uh, familiar with basic petrophysics measurement am i right or am i wrong Uh, yes, sir. We have studied like a uh, basics of petrophysics. Okay, cool. Mm, thank you very much, Sandeep. Okay, so now when somebody decides whether we need to log LWD or wire line, mm, generally the decisions are made based on different factors. Okay, uh, whenever we have uh, whenever the rig cost is high and when does the rig cost more when the rig is offshore deep water whenever i am trying to drill very horizontal wells uh, if i have to log a lot of times then this is something a place where the rig cost becomes very high so this is a place where i might prefer logging lwd tools rather than wireline I prefer to log wire line when I have lower rig costs, when the wells are vertical, when there is low geomechanical risk. What does low geomechanical risk mean? It means that the borehole that I'm drilling, if it is less prone to collapse or something like that, like I've drilled a well, right? I've drilled a well, but does it say, stay a circular hole, a cylinder all the time? Not really, with time, it can deteriorate, it can change its shape. I might have borehole collapse. I might have uh, different conditions happening to the well. I might have fractures created in the well bore. If I have all of these things, uh, logging wire line becomes a very risky thing, okay? And if the borehole deteriorates, then there is a high possibility that even if I acquired the logs, they may not be of very good quality. So again, in this kind of thing, we might want to prefer LWD over wireline. Um, the other aspect is that if it's a horizontal well, I want to know where the well is. I want to know whether I'm drilling in the reservoir. If I'm not drilling in the reservoir, how, what do I do to get up into the reservoir? And the only way you can make a decision like that is if you are actually looking at the data in real time. Okay, so you need to know that uh, I am placing the well in the right place. This, again, this doesn't apply in vertical wells. If I'm logging a vertical well, it's a vertical well. Mm, so I'm not trying to place it in a particular reservoir. So in those kind of cases, uh, I don't really care and I can log wireline. line. The other thing is that if there are unique measurements which are available either on LWD or wild line, we can make a decision like that. If it's a measurement I really need, then I can make a decision. The other thing can be that certain tools and measurements cannot be done in certain borehole sizes. The most common reservoir borehole size is either eight and a half inch hole size or a six inch hole size. That's the most common hole size. Uh, however, if we have a different hole size, it's a possibility that certain tools cannot be run. So that is also something which can um, sway our decision. So this is a cartoon, but it's a very interesting one. Okay. Uh, so I talked about LWD and I talked about the fact that I want to know where I am. Okay, I want to know uh, where I'm going. I want to know what is going to happen ahead. So if you look at this cartoon, it basically shows people on a boat and the person who, who is, has the control is basically saying that his real-time analysis says that it's going to be smooth sailing. Okay, uh, it looks smooth, it looks calm, etc., etc. However, <sighs> If you look at the full picture, it basically says that 
there is a waterfall ahead. So while in real time, it's good to know that what's around you, what needs to happen is that I need to know whether what I'm seeing now, whether it will continue or whether I can see something dangerous potentially ahead. Do I have a like, of course, I am not going to have a waterfall in the reservoir, but do I have a fault ahead? OK, so do I have an overpressured zone ahead which can lead to kicks and which can potentially cause a danger to my well? So I don't want to know what is ahead and what is going to happen. OK, so whatever data I'm acquiring in real time, it needs to be used to update and refine what I'm going to see ahead. OK, so this is the value of real time data when I'm drilling. OK, so this is a very, very simplistic log. I'm going to show a lot more complex logs when I'm uh, going to uh, show you the case studies. OK, but this is a very simple log which shows gamma ray, which shows the caliper and which shows the neutron porosity the density and the density porosity, okay? And basically the, the density and neutron curves are probably our most significant and important curves in terms of deciding things, okay? So this is just to show it to you, but I'm going to talk about logs in more details later when I'm going into the case studies, okay? So I mentioned that for wildline tools, we mostly log in uh, vertical wells. However, as time has gone by, we have realized that, OK, we cannot actually run wildline in very highly deviated wells. So we can only run wildline where we can rely on the tools going down by gravity if the well deviation is less than 60 degrees. OK, and deviation is what? Deviation is angle from the vertical. OK, like th this th would be a vertical well and this would be a horizontal well at 90 degrees. So if I go more than 60 degrees, most probably the the tool is just going to sit on the bottom of the well board. It's not going to go down. So we have different ways of uh, sending wireline tools down hole if the if it becomes high angle wells. We have something known as TLC. TLC stands for tough logging conditions. So this is when we attach the, the uh, violin tools at the bottom of the drill pipe, and that's how they are conveyed. We can put violin tools with coil tubing and send them down. This is an example of a coil tubing. Uh, you can have tractors. You can put certain mechanisms which is going to convey the tool. They can be with wheels and things like that, which can convey the tool downhole and high angle wells. Uh, one of a more recent development has been something known as the through bit technology, where as the name suggests, it's through the bit. OK, so the bit, instead of being a solid piece of metal, it has a hole in the middle and you can send your tools down through the bit, OK? Uh, can I drill long intervals with such a bit, with a, such a big hole? Not really. So you need to drill with a normal bit, and then you need to pull out a hole, come to surface, take go in with a bit which has that hole, maybe drill a little bit, and then you can send down the tools through the bit, OK? So these are some options of conveying wireline tools. If I'm really desperate that I need wireline measurements in a horizontal or a high angle well, then these are some options by which we can do it. Okay. So we have different types of measurements, okay? And we have different domains or disciplines who look at these measurements. You have the petrophysicists who look at density logs, neutrons, gamma ray, resistivity measurements. You have the geologists who are focused on borehole image logs, okay? 
borehole image logs don't mean that we are sending a camera down to take an image, but we are using different measurements to try to get a pseudo image of the borehole. Okay, these are most commonly, these are resistivity image logs that it shows resistivity contrast. If I have resistivity contrast between one layer and another, then it shows up on borehole images. I'm going to show you some examples. We have geophysicists who look at VSP, which is uh, seismic done on, in, the, in the borehole, okay? Uh, we also do sonic measurements. Now, these are all static logs, okay? What does static logs mean? Static logs mean that these logs give you uh, an answer about what the reservoir has, okay? It does not necessarily tell you whether it is going to flow or not. And that's where dynamic logs come in. Dynamic logs are looked at by reservoir engineers. Reservoir engineers look at formation pressures and they look at sampling. That, okay, uh, formation has water or oil or gas, but will it flow? And that's where we look at formation pressure measurements and we try to take a sample of the fluid which is there inside the reservoir. So these are looked at by reservoir engineers and when we go into a production phase uh, of the reservoir, we have production engineers who are looking at production logs, okay? What is flowing? How much is flowing? At what rate it is flowing? And, and as you can see that petrophysics is a, is a small part of this entire thing, okay? Everybody needs to work together in order to uh, come up with a final answer for the reservoir, okay? So what are basic petrophysical evaluation? What, am I, what are the answers I'm looking at? I'm trying to know whether I have clay or shale. What is the lithology? Where are the bed boundaries? There are different measurements for this. So I am going to share these slides with you. So you will have these uh, with you for later, okay? Uh, for each of these things, each of these answers that I'm trying to get, I have different measurements, okay? I have, uh, for porosity evaluation, I can use neutron, I can use density, I can use NMR. And for saturation, the most common answer is resistivity. However, I have other measurements like dielectric and pulse neutron measurements, which give sigma and carbon oxygen for these uh, evaluation as well. I do understand that some of these measurements might not be familiar to you, and but I honestly <laughs> do not have the time to go through each of these measurements in details. If at any point of time, uh, some of you are interested in, for uh, any particular measurements, you can either contact me or we can even try to organize a different webinar at some point of time, okay? So this is the standard Archie's equation. Can somebody please unmute and tell me that, are you familiar with Archie's equation? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So this is a, the, so Archie came up with this equation in 1940, right? And when he came up with this equation, he did his experiments on sandstones and he came up with this. Nowadays, everybody uses Archie's equation, whether we are in carbonates, whether we are in plastic, sandstones, everywhere we are using Archie's equation. And to a certain extent, they are, it is applicable, it works to a certain extent. Does it do a great job everywhere? Not really. Now, even when I'm talking about Archie's equation, I'm talking about the fact that there are certain things which I can get from measurements and certain things which I need to know separately, okay? Like the formation water resistivity, this is something I can derive from logs, okay? Uh, this is uh, the, uh, both the formation water resistivity and formation resistivity are resistivities, as the name suggests. 
Uh, the formation porosity is something which I can measure from logs. Now, A is a empirical factor, the default is one. But there are two other factors here which are very, very critical and which affect my calculation of uh, water saturation to a large extent. One is cementation exponent or M. And this is something which we take as a default value of two, but it can change drastically depending on whether I have whether the formation is very clean porosity or whether the porosity is getting blocked by certain things. So it can change. It can go up. Most of the time it will go up. The values can go higher. N is another thing which is known as saturation exponent. Again, the default value is taken as 2, which is true if I have water wet formations. What does water wet formations mean? that if I have oil and water in a pore space, the one which is contacting the wall is basically the water. It's not the oil, okay? Uh, during the course of a formation of a reservoir, every reservoir starts out as a water wet reservoir, but it can change to oil wet. If it does, then this N value no longer remains true. So do I know from before, do I have a water wet reservoir or an oil wet reservoir? I do not. I'm logging it. That, that, that's the entire reason for logging. So uh, how do I know about these things? And formation water resistivity is something which I can get from water samples. I can derive it from if I have a water zone inside the interval where I log as well. Uh, I can measure formation resistivity from standard resistivity logs. Formation porosity is coming from the porosity logs. And, but anything I want to know about M and N, I either need to get core data, which means I need to actually get cores and then measure it on the cores, which take time. There are certain new uh, measurements like multi-frequency dielectric measurements, which also give you some idea about saturation exponent and the cementation exponent. Uh, other than standard triple combo measurement, which we do, triple combo is the basic measurement which we do. Triple combo basically stands for three measurements. One is gamma ray, the other is nuclear measurements, which is density and neutron, and the third is resistivity, okay? NMR logging is something which becomes very, very critical in certain clastic reservoirs, but it becomes very important in carbonate reservoirs. So it helps us determine free and bound fluid volumes. It tells us how a pore space is. So it's basically, it's, it is uh, it's sensitive to the texture of the rock that, okay, I have pore spaces, but are the pores bigger, smaller? Uh, and th this is extremely important that do I if I have big pores, I know that I can produce faster from there. The permeability will be higher there, okay? NMR helps us in, in terms of knowing where I have heavy oil or tar. If I have oil, then what is the viscosity of that oil? These are some answers which come out of NMR logging. Now, if I go into logs which are more used for understanding the geology of the formation, I'm looking at borehole image logs, okay? So borehole image logs are used for structural analysis, how much is the formation dipping, stratigraphic analysis, understanding whether I have fractures in the formation, and you have different tools. Uh, I actually originally did not intend to show uh, like Schlumberger specific tool names, but uh, these are there just as an example. Okay, so in water-based muds, I can run a tool called FMI. In oil-based muds, our normal measurements will not work, right? It's oil-based. So and I'm looking at resistivity images. When I'm talking about resistivity images, I'm trying to push current into the formation and then it is coming back. So 
if I have oil in the borehole, then it cannot go through normally. So I need to find other ways of pushing the current through. So you need different kind of tools if I have an oil-based mud. You can have something called as ultrasonic images where I have a transducer which is sending out ultrasonic waves which are coming back. Okay, that's how I get ultrasonic images. Uh, other logs which are referred to as geological logs are mineralogical logs that I know what kind of a lithology I have. This is something which is useful information for both a geologist as well as a petrophysicist. Okay, and this is just to show you an example of how a borehole image uh, looks like. On the right hand side, it shows a resistivity image. The resistivity image basically on the left hand side is what you will see on the core. Okay, on the right hand side is what you will see on the borehole image downhole. Okay, if I have uh, these holes are basically places from which we have taken sidewall cores. Okay, so the, the of course it is there in the core, but if I log the formation, then I also see it in the formation as well. The holes from where the I have taken the cores. Okay. Uh, Again, this is just to show you an example of borehole images. Remember, these are resistivity images. So dark is conductive and white is resistive. So the more white a formation is, it means it is more resistive. Okay. So, and these are different formations. Okay. If I have different formations, then mm, I have a bedding in between the different formations and I can get an idea about structural lip i can take a look at the image to see if there are wugs if there are faults fractures and based on all of these things i can get an idea integrating it maybe not in a single well but if i have multiple wells with images i can integrate that in order to talk about a depositional system am i in a fluvial system am i in a shallow marine system and these kind of things okay so Imaging has all these sort of applications, which uh, is useful for different people. Okay. So geophysical logs, these are uh, basically borehole seismic logs, and there are different types. Again, I have put them on the slide, but I'm not going to go into details of this, but these are these different ones are basically done in different kinds of wells like a, this would be done in a vertical well and a vertical incidence or a walk away vsp would be done in high angle or horizontal wells i use sonic logs sonic logs have massive amount of application okay they are used for petrophysics they are used by geophysicists they are used by geomechanics engineers so sonic measurements are something which are very, very versatile. And this is just to show you the list of things which can be done with sonic. I started off my career processing sonic logs. So sonic is a subject which is a bit dear to me. Uh, and but it has all these sort of applications. OK, it can be used by geophysicists, petrophysicists use it, geomechanics or reservoir engineers use it, and people who are working in drilling also use sonic logs, okay? So basically it's something which is used by multiple disciplines. Uh, one slide before I go into the carbonates part is that uh, something which I do not do on a day-to-day -day basis, but something which is extremely important on a uh, for a reservoir for any company is that okay I can a petrophysicist can tell you how much oil or gas you have but can you say for certain whether that oil or gas will flow and that's where reservoir measurements come in that you are talking about taking fluid samples you're trying to see what how much pressure there is in the formation so these are very critical information to understand the dynamic behavior of the reservoir OK, you can take standard fluid samples or you can take uh, very high quality fluid samples and you're trying to identify what sort of fluid you have. 
you use optical analyzers to understand whether you have water gas or oil and how much oil there is uh, what is the composition of that oil is it a light oil is it a heavy oil and these kind of information okay okay as i promised two slides on carbonates okay and this is a standard log what do i see on the log i see gamma ray i have resistivities and i have density and neutron here okay looks very simple the resistivity does not seem very high uh, the gamma ray is low which means it does not have a lot of clay mm, and i have all these different lobes of porous layers but overall if you look at the scale it's a pretty high porosity rock it's about more than 15 pu around 20 porosity units okay the question is is this Mm, is this a uh, this is a single reservoir mm, but is this does this is this so simple okay generally the data that i acquire is, is triple combo which is the data i have showing right now but if i look at another measurements which is nmr nmr tells me that the top of this reservoir is very different than the bottom of the reservoir okay the bottom of the reservoir has more small pores the upper part of this reservoir has these big pores if i have big pores that means i have more permeability i have much better production so if i do not have nmr i would think that i can produce from this entire reservoir more or less in the same way but nmr is basically telling me that the upper part of this reservoir yes we can you can produce from it very easily but the lower part of this reservoir would be very difficult to produce from okay because it has small pores so the petrophysical challenge which we face in carbonates is that sometimes the mineralogy is complex and if the mineralogy is complex then estimating porosity becomes a complicated thing okay you have a very complex pore system and this is exactly what we saw in the last slide that it can have large pores small pores so and that controls permeability one other thing is calculating saturation how do i know what sort of m and n to use in carbonates archie did all his experiments on sandstones so is it valid to use two and two for m and n in uh, for carbonates in some cases it is in a lot of cases it's not wettability is something which is going to affect the n and the effect of fractures so these are all things which make uh, doing petrophysics in carbonates quite complicated in certain reservoirs it's more complicated than others in certain reservoirs it's very simple okay uh there are some additional complexities but this uh, can happen in sandstones as well uh you can have heavy oil or tar you can have variable or low salinity as soon as you have your salinity goes variable it makes it very complex to do saturation calculations okay you have something called a low resistivity p a low resistivity p is when the resistivity is low as a result you might think that you have water but in reality you actually have oil okay so low resistivity p is something which has confused people petrophysicists all over and it makes it a little bit complex so i'm going to talk about two case studies and as i mentioned i'm going to, to go through the second case study very very quickly but the first case study is a more simpler one uh, i've given the sp paper number below so you can take a look at the paper if you do not have access to the paper then let me know and i can send you the paper okay mm, this is just about putting things together okay and so we drilled this well this was a vertical well 
and the first measurements that we had uh, from these uh, from this well was uh, mud logs okay and uh, standard lwd logs okay and i'm going to go through the tracks a little bit so this shows the mud gas the hydrocarbon percentage the shading clearly shows where i have hydrocarbon these are the different uh, hydrocarbon types okay uh, c1 c2 going up to c5 we do quantitative fluid compositions up to c5 anything above that is more qualitative this is something which is known as wetness and balance uh, when we you compute wetness and balance and if you uh, plot it in a certain way it shows you the hydrocarbon type okay the yellow color the uh, more uh, the when the color is like uh, this it basically shows you uh, that i have uh, more gas rather than oil okay if i go more towards the greenish part of it the, then it will show that i have oil as i go more towards this side reddish orangish it shows that i have gas the way wetness and balance is calculated is basically using these compositions okay the more i have lighter fraction as i'm going having more of c1 c2 it means i have more gas kind of a fluid if i have more of the heavier fraction c4 c5 or uh, heavier than that then it's more likely to be oil so i had gamma ray measurements i have caliper measurements and i have density neutron here and this shows that okay i have oil or gas here based on this this shows me that it is gas so i have gas here and here i have reservoirs upper reservoir this is the middle reservoir this is the lower reservoir the lower reservoir it does not really show a lot of gas okay uh, in terms of density neutron separations it does not show that i have a too much of a separation so immediately based on this i have an expectation okay before i acquire any more advanced logs my expectation is most probably i have gas here and most probably i do not have gas here okay how do i confirm this i acquire more advanced set of logs okay and i have done a petrophysical evaluation i have done a petrophysical evaluation which tells me it's mostly it's basically calcite carbonate limestone uh, i might have some clays here but not much when i do a saturation calculation it shows me that i have as i had expected i have mostly uh, hydrocarbon in this upper interval the here the scale the way the scale is running as i'm going here is uh, low water saturation here is high water saturation so here I'm showing low water saturation, which means I have hydrocarbon. And here I have high water saturation. I have here the results of when I did the fluid sampling, what am I getting? I'm getting uh, uh, the GOR. I'm getting very high GOR here. And I have very low GOR. And I'm actually getting water in the reservoir here so whatever i saw from my uh, from my immediate mud logs and immediate basic logs when i do my evaluation it basically says the same thing and when i take samples the samples came out to be gas here gas here water here okay you can do certain other things when we are looking at advanced measurements so that we can look at the borehole images we can see what kind of porosity you have ultimately when this well was we did the well testing in this uh, well uh, it validated everything that we had said from the logs ultimately when we go through this process of evaluating a well i'm starting from the logs but finally 
uh, we go towards a well test, which is telling me what is away from the wells, because uh, whatever is at the borehole wall does not always mean that it's going to be same for the entire reservoir. Okay, so it's basically validated our A in this particular. That may not always be the case, but in this particular case, it was. It was a very simple story. Okay. You had mud gas, the mud gas showed high mud gas in certain zones, low mud gas in certain zones. The high mud gas zones, it produced gas, low mud gas zones produce water. Simple, right? So this is the, uh, the reason I showed this particular case study is to tell you that sometimes things can be very, very simple. Okay. The, from very basic measurements, I can do an interpretation and that will be valid. And that concludes my first case study, okay? My second case study is more complicated, okay? Uh, the Are you guys familiar with unconventional reservoirs? Can somebody unmute, please? So we have not studied unconventional reservoirs yet. Okay, thank you very much, Sandeep. Okay, so unconventional reservoirs, as the name suggests, is not conventional, okay? Uh, the pioneer in terms of uh, unconventionals has the US, okay? And what is unconventional reservoirs? Unconventional reservoirs are not standard carbonates and plastics. They are usually the source rocks, okay? where I'm actually, I have done the cooking, I have done the diagenesis, the oil is generated, the gas is generated, but it has not left the source rock, okay? It is still sitting inside the source rock. So, the, and this is something which, uh, when initially uh, US started this process, they drilled a lot of wells and they figured out that, Yes, we can uh, get oil and gas production from the source rocks. These unconventional source rocks are complicated because they do not have high porosity and permeability as the reservoirs. Okay, They are low porosity, they are low permeability. And most of the time, you actually need to create artificial fractures in these formations in order to try to flow, okay? So Middle East does not have the same problem as the US. Middle East has a lot of oil, but certain countries have less gas than other places. And gas, as all of you know, is considered to be a cleaner source of energy than oil. So a lot of people are looking at unconventionals in the Middle East because they want to look at, they want to get gas, okay? Qatar does not have the problem. Qatar has a lot of gas, but other countries in the Middle East do not. Okay, They have more oil than gas. So these slides have a slightly different animation because these slides were actually presented at uh, uh, one of the industry conferences. So the format and the layout, they are uh, basically the ones which were used in for the conference. So. I will, uh, I'm just going to go through a little bit uh, quicker, but I'll, th this will sort of show you how complex evaluation can get. That in uh, unconventionals, I am looking at, these are source rocks, okay? So these have uh, kerogen. I'm looking at total organic carbon, TOC. Is it mature enough? Is it mature enough that it is uh, producing oil or gas. And then I'm looking for more conventional answers like uh, how, what is the lithology, what is the porosity, how much is the saturation. But the biggest part is permeability and reservoir producibility index. That is it going to produce? Yes, I have oil or gas sitting there, but is it going to produce? Now, in case of conventional reservoirs, it's more standard that if I have porosity, I should have some amount of permeability. 
these rocks are complex the, the unconventional they have very very low porosity the porosities are to the order of 4 pu 5 pu 6 pu 7 pu like more than 5 pu is considered to be fantastic porosity for unconventionals that's not the case for conventions in conventionals i would consider probably 10 pu or 15 pu as good porosity the other thing which becomes extremely important in unconventionals is something known as geomechanics that I want to understand the mechanical properties of the reservoir. I want to understand the stress the reservoir is under because this is something which is going to uh, control whether I can fracture, create a fracture in this reservoir in order to produce the oil or the gas which is there. Okay, so uh, this was the formation which we were looking at. This was in the uh, southwest of Abu Dhabi. And conventionally, everybody had gone for the anticlines. Okay, the conventional reservoirs are on the anticlines. You go for that. Okay, this particular well that we were targeting was in the syncline. Why the syncline? Because the syncline is deeper. So I expect that the formation is more, uh, it's hotter. So which means things have gotten cooked more. Okay. So that was what we wanted to look at. Now, when I'm looking at uh, a reservoir quality evaluation workflow, I'm looking at a lot of measurements to look for a lot of things. I'm looking at TOC, how much organic carbon there is. I'm looking at lithology, porosity, saturation, all of these things. And because this was the first well which went into the syncline, we actually cored a big part of this well in order to ensure we can acquire core measurements and do core analysis in order to validate everything that a petrophysicist is going to save from the logs, okay? And with that, we did uh, TOC uh, measurements from log as well as from core. And we said that, okay, certain uh, log measurements, the black points are core. And I want my red curve, which is coming from the logs, to match the core as well as possible. You can immediately see that these techniques that we have used they did not do that good a job, whereas the, these two seem to have done a much better job in terms of the red curve matching the black curve a lot better. Okay, so uh, this is what we used in terms of maturity. Uh, when we did the core analysis, it basically showed we are in the early maturity stage Okay, uh, of the oil window. Okay, this was not gas. Initially, the uh, when we logged this, the client expected that it might be gas, but this was not the case. When we did the core analysis, we figured out we are still in the oil window. Okay, now this was the reservoir. <sighs> if I, uh, if you talk to anybody from the US or anybody who has worked in the US on conventionals, uh, they will say this does not look like unconventional reservoir. This looks like a clean limestone, okay? And it is a clean limestone. And this is something which is very, very typical of unconventionals of the Middle East, that these do not have a lot of shale, okay? They are more like organic mudstones where I have kerogen. This brown stuff is kerogen. This is where the oil was formed and it was getting cooked and it was getting matured, okay? And we did, basically the purpose of showing you this slide is to show you the, the lithology. But the other thing to show you is that every log interpretation that I did in this particular A had to be validated with core data as well, okay? so. You have all these points, these are basically code data, okay? So, which validates our log interpretation. So, when uh, we are doing, under, trying to understand a reservoir for the first time, we 
look at acquiring code data in order to validate our log interpretation. Okay, once we are sure that our interpretation techniques are working well, after that we might stop acquiring code data. Okay, uh, the saturation it showed that we have quite a lot of oil. Okay, but I'll point your eyes to one thing okay this is this track okay this porosity was on a scale of 0 to 10 okay 10 porosity units this is in terms of percentage this is not in this is in terms of decimals but if i talk about percentage how much porosity i have this is 0 percent porosity this is 10 percent porosity so yes i have oil but the porosity is very very low the porosity is coming out to be around two porosity units most of the cases in some places it goes higher okay so this is the problem of unconventional that the even though i have oil but the oil is in very very small pores and it is in very very low porosity okay so probably one zone where i have more porosity is probably this zone and this is something which might be something which we might target okay uh this is a reasonably recent work on unconventionals that how to get an idea about how much a reservoir is going to produce it is called rpi this is a publication from 2015 which shows that how to get an idea about where i have higher producibility uh, and when i look at this reservoir producibility index basically i get certain places where i have higher production potential and if i multiply it by the permeability then i narrow it down even further okay so the reservoir producibility index in this particular case is actually higher in this place where I do not have a lot of kerogen. It's as if the oil was cooked here, it was produced here, and then it got expelled into the this port space above. So in this particular well, that is what we were targeting. We were targeting zones which had lesser kerogen okay uh this slide i am not going to go into the details of but this is just to tell you that this geomechanics is something which is extremely critical in unconventionals because since i need to create fractures in the formation i need to know whether the formation is strong weak can i create fractures if i want to create fractures do i want to create fractures in a particular zone rather than another zone okay and that's why i want to identify the stresses i want to identify how i can break down the formation okay uh, for that we use all this log data we use drilling records we whatever code data we have acquired we use those lab measurements and we need borehole image and caliper data as well okay these were the conclusions of that particular formation that it was extremely heterogeneous it contained organic rich and calcite rich rocks and the free hydrocarbon which will flow was associated or it was near to the kerogen rich zones but not the exact kerogen rich zone it was near to it okay the rock was extremely compact and it was extremely difficult to create fracture in this particular rock so as of now not everything is a success story some of them are learning lessons in this particular well what we learned was that this rock is very very compact and it was very very difficult to create fractures in this formation so eventually this project was kept on hold for that point of time and it is only in 2021 after the covid that they decided to go back in this area and try to look at it slightly further 
Okay. Okay. Uh, to conclude my presentation, uh, petrophysics is by itself is extremely vast. Okay. And I think what I have given you is just a very, very basic taste of what petrophysics is. It's a very small, but a very integral piece of the puzzle for solving reservoir issues. Okay. And all complex reservoirs, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. Everybody needs to work together. Okay. Uh, what I do or what I have talked to you about today is operations petrophysics, where we focus on single well operations. I'm looking more at analyzing the data in one well. Um, there is another branch of petrophysics, which is reservoir petrophysics, which work on more multi-well reservoir studies. When we have data from a lot of wells, we put them all together and try to analyze that in order to come up with more strategies for the reservoir. Operations petrophysics is the first step. Reservoir petrophysics is the final step. Okay. Now, all different reservoirs, whether clastics, carbonates, or unconventionals, they have their unique set of challenges. Uh, I would not underestimate any over another. Just the complexities are different. Clastics are simpler in terms of texture. But clastics have the issue that uh, they have different amounts of shales, okay, different amounts of clay minerals. Carbonates do not have that issue. Carbonates have an issue of texture. The textures are very variable. Unconventionals combine all the complexities together. That's why they're unconventionals. Okay, so basically that's it from my side. Okay, we, I basically have taken up one hour, 10 minutes. Well, considering five minutes because we started five minutes later. And I would really like if you have some questions, uh, if you are too shy to ask questions, you can always drop me an email on LinkedIn. Well, you can drop a, me a message on LinkedIn. I can, I can, will definitely get back to you. So let me know what questions you have. Uh, okay, first question from Rashmi about tractor technology. So Rashmi, tractors is basically a, a technology which is used in high angle wells where I'm trying to convey the tools uh, where gravity will not work. So I either have rollers or wheels which function with a hydraulic mechanism in order to push and pull the tools downhole and uphole. Okay. So it is required both for going downhole, but downhole is easier, of course. But as soon as you try putting pulling it up, it makes it slightly more complicated. Okay. Uh, I think the next question was about low resistivity pain. Okay. Uh, there are different uh, uh, reasons for having low resistivity. Okay. One of the reasons which is common in plastics is that I have clay minerals which are uh, which are either present in form of lamination or it might be scattered as well, but presence of clay decreases resistivity. So in clastics, a lot of time, low resistivities are caused because of uh, presence of shale or clay. And you want to ensure that you are taking that into account. In carbonates, uh, it is different because uh, you do not have the shale problem anymore. In carbonates, it might be caused by the fact that you have different pore spaces which have different fluids. Okay. Like the the if the small pores have only water and the big pores have oil, there is a possibility that when I'm sending a resistivity current, the resistivity is getting short circuited through the uh, uh, through the small pores 
and it is reading a very very low resistivity whereas the oil is sitting in the larger pores and as soon as i go and try to produce from it it is going to produce oil so what is the way around it as the name suggests it's a low resistivity pay so which means i cannot use resistivity for evaluating these reservoirs i need to use something else it can be dielectric it can be sigma um, carbon oxygen and other measurements in order to get an answer in these places okay uh question from farisa in the conventional reservoirs even after the primary and secondary eor there is still 60 to 70 percent oil trapped so which is more difficult to extract the leftover oil in conventional reservoirs or the oil in unconventional reservoirs interesting question uh the conventional reservoirs this number of 60 to 70 percent of the oil being trapped this is uh, something which is this number is going to vary from place to place okay uh, as i said i have worked mostly in the middle east uh, here this number goes down to 30 to 40 percent okay once you get down to 30 to 40 percent it becomes near to impossible to extract this oil now unconventionals have multiple challenges unconventionals have uh the fact that it, it does not have a lot of pore space okay it does not have a lot of pore space so it does not have a lot of uh oil to begin with and then you need to create fractures okay so in conventionals when i'm getting down to that stage that I, the only oil i have is this remaining oil or residual oil if it is residual, then it is really sticking to the formation. Okay, the un... so it the final decision is going to depend on the economics of the decision. Okay, is it more expensive for me to to create fractures in the conventionals to get it out, or to create fractures in the unconventionals? Unconventionals are more difficult to frack, but they might have certain free oil or gas which i want to flow the conventionals while it might be easier to frack because they have port space at the same time it is already down to a residual stage so it does not have the drive for it to come out so the final decision definitely depends on uh, the economics of it that uh, Technically speaking, both are very complex and both are difficult. Unconventionals might have slightly more oil, even though they have lesser pore spaces, but uh, it might be more freer to flow uh, if I frack it. Mm, what is the maximum depth that we drill using the through bit? Uh, the, this is the thing that the through bit, it has a hole in the middle right uh, the bit is a special bit the, it has a hole in the middle you cannot really drill a lot you can drill maybe 200 feet 300 feet with this so you need to drill with a normal bit then you need to come out of hole put in the special through bit bit go down and then you send the tools down through the drill pipe out of the bit and then log so there is no limit as to the maximum depth in in terms of depth how far we can log in terms of how much we can drill we can drill only maybe 300 400 maybe you can go up to 500 feet depending on the formation but you cannot drill a lot with this special bit this bit is for logging and it for it is for reaming and this kind of operation that if i get stuck at least i can rotate Any other question? Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So I think we're done with the questions from the attendees. 
So thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful lecture. I'm sure everyone has gained knowledge from this. We have attended a lot of webinars, but never encountered the concepts related to petrophysics. So for the first time ever, we got to know how physics can be involved in the petroleum sector. This will be a great help for us towards the journey of becoming a petroleum engineer. Now, as All the right. questions from the attendees are done, we have some questions from our side to you. So sure. I would like to ask my first question that what is the most important skills that a petrophysicist should have? Petrophysicist should have. Look, uh, there are very few places where petrophysics is taught as a degree. There are some places where petrophysics is taught as a degree. But in most cases, uh, what you have is one coursework, right? You have one a semester in which you have one subject. Uh, it is uh, talked in different ways in different places uh, uh, in some places it's called borehole geophysics in some places it's called petrophysics etc etc so nobody is born a skillful petrophysicist so everybody knows a little bit about petrophysics and the only way of learning petrophysics is by doing it and most either service company or ENP companies when they're looking for recruitments what they're looking is for people who are willing to learn that you know the basics, but you're willing to learn new things. That's what people are looking for. As long as that is satisfied, you can become a good petrophysicist. You need to have your basics strong. When I talk about basics, I talk about basic idea about how the measurements work. Okay, How does the resistivity work? How does the density work? How does the neutron work? In a lot of cases, people don't even know that. People know, like I come from a geology background. I'm a geologist with the, in terms of studies. Uh, I knew more geology and then I came into petrophysics. So the basic key is to have a basic idea about general basic idea, but the biggest part is hard work and willingness to learn because you are going to learn a lot of things which are not taught in universities, but uh, which are extremely critical to work uh, thank you so much sir uh, that was such an informative answer uh, well i would like to ask one more question on behalf of all the attendees like if sure. you had this opportunity to take extra training in a specific area of petrophysics what would that be <sighs> that is <laughs> difficult to answer because Honestly, petrophysics is is too vast a topic to for me to tell you that this is something you should take a extra uh, training in because all the measurements are important in their own ways. Okay, so I cannot tell you a particular measurement. So the one thing which uh, people might appreciate is that you do not only understand log measurements but you understand interpretation of the logs okay so if at any point of time you guys have uh, have a chance to attend some trainings or some courses on log interpretation then that is something people would appreciate that you understand how to interpret the logs yes i have logs but how do i interpret that to get meaningful answers. So that can be a software course that you understand certain softwares. Now, uh, unfortunately, different service providers have different softwares. Different ENP companies use different softwares. So uh, you can learn a certain software, but at the same time, uh, you should not focus on the software itself too much because then you are only valuable to the person who is using that software, to the company who is using that software. So the more critical part is understanding the logs, using cross plots, using techniques to do the interpretation itself. So I would say that if you have any way of learning log interpretation, that would be something which would be useful for a bigger uh, range of companies and uh, like bigger range of companies basically 
thank you thank you so much sir for this beautifully explained answer i hope all the attendees have got the answer to their question so with uh, the question and answer session we come to an end of this uh, beautiful webinar so we consider ourselves immensely lucky today that we got to interact with you sir the insight you provided us with about petrophysics is uh, at such an early stage of our engineering journey is truly an eye opening we all thank you for your guidance again sir we all will work ahead with diligence and stick to the principles and advice you provided us today hope every student has enjoyed this and learned something new today thank you for joining today's meet sir surely we will follow the things you have said um so before coming to an end of this extremely informative webinar so if you want to share your experience of the of today's webinar um no i had a fantastic time presenting uh, you guys were interactive and you guys asked questions so so that was good i can only hope that whatever i presented is of some use to you guys and as i said before if you have any follow up questions uh you can ask me on linkedin i can provide uh, my personal email id as well uh and i may not be always be very prompt with answers depending on how busy i am but i can assure you that if you have a question i will definitely get back to you okay so that's it from my side yes, thank true. you very much for the opportunity Uh, thank you sir we are pleased to have you here today uh, this was uh, truly an informative webinar and uh, yet a very interactive one so thank you sir it was our pleasure to have you here today i would like to request my friend vaidhi now to officially close the webinar for today i on behalf of spe idism student chapter extend a hearty vote of thanks to mr subodip das gupta sir for gracing us with his intellectual presence So with this, we come to the end of this meeting. This is your host Vedhi Mishra and co-host Harshita Jha signing off. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye.